Dear students and professors, dear guests, it is uh, my honor to open the sixth November Talks lecture series here in Prague. Uh, we are very happy that after a year where we had to cancel November Talks because of COVID-19, we can be here again in the aula face-to-face. -face. Uh, this year's theme is taking risks about the art of creating a material world. As you know, and especially since last week when we had the Dean election, we have over 50% of our students women. And we have very few women that are leading practices in the, our profession. Before my dean, my vice dean period ends, I wanted to invite at least a majority of women into the November Talks series to show a different approach to practice, an approach which we might call uh, more detail, more feminine, maybe not, maybe yes, but just open a uh, a role model open a discussion about is there any difference and how should we teach in order to encourage women to take over practices and to be 50% plus maybe in the professional world. Marusha Zoret is a Slovenian architect one of the most famous Slovenian architects, and we met uh, two years ago in Zagreb. Uh, she had a wonderful lecture, and we invited her at that time to come over to Prague. Uh, she is the founder and the member of an uh, architecture practice called Area Architecti, and uh, she is specialized in uh, something we would call uh, heritage, protection, renovation, reconstruction, addition, development, but not only that, also new projects. She is a very all-round architect, working in an unbelievably precise and, uh, and poetic way. Uh, her office has received numerous awards, such as the Prishan Prize, the Plechnik Prize, the Piranesi Award, or the Stele Award for Protection of Slovenian Cultural Heritage. She will be presenting five of her projects and uh, other, other uh, experiences from her uh, work and also her teaching, because she teaches at the Ljubljana School of Architecture. And while we were waiting for the lecture, we were talking about that in the 1990s, there was very much cooperation between the Prague and the Ljubljana schools of architecture. We have very many common themes, and we seem to have forgotten this intense cooperation in the last years, even though we had Vasa Perovic here as a visiting architect. Uh, the lecture series and the November talks is possible thanks to the support of the Stowe Foundation. Uh, as you remember, it was uh, Uwe Koss with Zdeněk Zavřel that six years ago started this, uh, this cooperation. And Uwe Koss retired. His place uh, has been taken on by Til Stahlbuch, who sends his regards but cannot be here personally. So I think I said everything, and I give Marusha the word. Thank you. Uh, dear Irena, thank you very much for your kind words and uh, especially thanks you and the Dean for uh, inviting me um, to come to Prague. After so many years, I haven't been here for, I don't know, more than 20, 30 years. It's really a pleasure to, to return to this beautiful city. Um, uh, 
so I'm going to share share with you um, the the ways uh, we in my office think about uh, the world and the architecture, and somehow how in this field, uh, in a way, I started. When I started to lecture, I really questioned myself, what is it that makes it interesting that I show what I do and how I do? Because it seems that in architecture, the task is always given and it's the same, and the answers are so very much different uh, that are then responding this task. In that sense, I think we all have to rethink uh, the places we come from, uh, the stories we shared in our childhood, and uh, what really makes us so special and different, and how this can be really representing in the work we do. Uh, because I think it is possible uh, to, to present uh, your individuality, your own character, in, in, uh, also in the field of architecture. I think and I strongly believe it is possible to do something good in this, uh, this uh, time uh, and in, in the field that is very often uh, facing a lot of um, money and working just for a business. I, I don't believe that. I think it is possible to do something good for the space, for the places where we live and for the people who inhabit uh, our places. Um, two years ago, we were invited uh, to the Venice Biennale by the Grafton Architects to present uh, what we actually do. And uh, we decided to, to present that also in the book that is here. And we named our pavilion Unveiling the Hidden. That means somehow this title is connected with the work we do. Actually, with most of the projects you are going to see, we are... Uh, cre we are um, in, we are involved with the existing structures, with the existing spaces, with the existing, sometimes very much protected buildings. So um, we are very often dealing with the dust, with the dust that is in those spaces and very much worried what will happen with it because as Josef Brodsky here is writing, the dust is carrying with it, him also the flesh and blood of time, somehow inscribed in all those buildings and our uh, worries are, of course, how all these stories can be, of course, lost with, uh, with all these uh, interventions. So uh, we presented our pavilion in, in Arsenale and trying to think how, in fact, to, to uh, describe what actually we do and how to, uh, being involved also with the spaces where we were exhibiting, how to react to those beautiful walls and how to present the, the voids we are actually shaping in all the existing structures. So we planned to do a kind of a spatial models of our five projects, uh, digging them inside this uh, material and showing the liberating freeway uh, going and moving through these walls and presenting, um, presenting also the, this, uh, these uh, five projects, uh, inviting the visitors to to walk around and at the end also to come uh, to, to this uh, existing wall of the space. Um, so this is the team of my partners that I work with at the time in, in my office. We were here presenting the thing. And on the back sides of these panels, we also presented different topics that we are describing also in, in this book that are the topics that we are facing all the time in our project that are never asked by the clients to, to, to do them, but actually they are always around us and we are, uh, they are all our desires uh, uh, shaping our thoughts uh, with, the, with the projects we do. And on the back sides of these panels, one topic was devoted also to our ancestors, uh, like Otto Njugovac, the architect I studied uh, the work of. Uh, now this year we celebrate 100 years since he was born. And we wanted to present this architecture of the period of the 60s that, uh, I must admit, really uh, influenced the work that I do, the architecture that has been uh, since the 90s very much abandoned and very often demolished and in our, in our struggles. We struggle a lot to preserve this architecture, to keep it staying and inhabiting it with different functions. For instance, this is a building by Savin Sever that was lost. This is a building that was... Uh, 
that is dramatically changed. And here you see that these changes don't bring any good architecture. They are, in fact, creating uh, things that are not worth these names. So with these activities, we try to promote this architecture, and we managed and we achieved that some of those buildings really stayed. Uh, they are now shaping the new programs and creating really beautiful spaces of this architecture of the 70s and 60s, like this is the case of Edward Raunikar in Ljubljana now being a shop and opening completely this uh, ground floor as it was planned in the first, uh, in the first uh, project. Uh, on the back side of these panels, we presented also 15 topics that are essential for our work, like the topic of freedom, which is most beautifully represented with this building by Otto Njugovets, the architect I, I studied. This is a roof from 74, which is covering an archaeological site in the southeast of Slovenia. Uh, it is an interpretation of a wooden hayrack, a traditional building, but built in a very modern way. It is standing only on two columns, and it's somehow floating above this horizontal landscape. So it is enabling freedom to the space to flow below the roof, and at the same time also protecting this small church of St. Michael's. So uh, freedom, for me, is a very important uh, matter in architecture, I think, with the spaces we create, we have to enable freedom for all the users as different as they might be in, in our architecture. The next thing is, of course, the primeval space. This is the place where I come from. This is an image of, from the window of my childhood, these enormous forested uh, winter landscapes, or the Mediterranean, where I go every year. These are these primeval spaces that really shaped me as, as, uh, as I am, as those winter landscapes of the northwest uh, of Slovenia uh, are very essential for, for the works we do. The second motive is the silence, the silence that we try to seek in our projects and uh, try to find places where you can step out of this, uh, uh, this busy and uh, crowded world. Uh, another topic very important is the light. The light is somehow guiding us through the space and uh, with the interventions of demolitions and breaking or connecting, we are trying to involve the light into our projects and by that creating and shaping the path for all the users. Uh, dealing with the existing, of course, means also somehow to dig inside the existing and trying to create the space in between the existing walls. So, with that, we are very often revealing the stories, the stories of the past that are somehow inscribed into the existing structures we are working with, like the Plichnik House or the monastery we are just uh, renovating. And by that, the importance of the place comes um, to, to its essence, like in the library we created inside an old castle, by that we kept an old tree as the center of the main uh, entrance space uh, to the new program or a fireplace that is possible also to create a place of um, going to or the roof that is somehow it's a kind of a pilgrimage of all of our students sending me pictures when they are going to to visit this uh, this small piece of architecture um, dealing with the past or existing structures it reveals also all the layers of the past and it's very Difficult, I will try to show you with my projects how to present all these different layers and how to involve the layer of our time inside these, um, these uh, new buildings. So um, also in the sense of the urban plan, we are working with different layers of different times. Um, concept is, of course, also with the renovation project, a very important topic. I always say renovating does not mean just introducing new furniture into the space. It is much more than that. And I was learned that by an architect, Wojtek Raunikar, who passed 10 years ago, who taught me that architecture is thinking. And uh, we tried to uh, build an homage project to his work with this installation we did in a Museum of Architecture just this year, memorizing 10 years of um, since he passed away by focusing on the wall and on the window as very important elements of uh, his architecture. Um, 
Transitions is also a, uh, an, uh, a motive we are working a lot, uh, passing through the spaces, connecting the spaces, uh, opening in and outside spaces and binding them together with the views to the open horizons, like here in the case of a school that we did a couple of years ago. And by that, we come to the last topic, which is... Yeah? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, which is the horizon. Perhaps you can switch the lights off a little bit. Uh, the horizon uh, or the path that leads you to the open horizon is an important topic, which is here uh, taken the photo on, uh, on a very dear project of mine. This is the renovation of the Shantze project of, uh, done by Joze Plechnik above Ljubljana. Um, as I'm as it was mentioned, I come from Ljubljana. This is a city somehow between Vienna and Venice. And through that, in this city, uh, the experiences of all those places are very much present, like the experiences of the Viennese uh, uh, architects, as also our studies, uh, uh, our architects who studied in Vienna, or uh, were always longing to the Mediterranean that is here, for instance, presenting in the architecture of Italy. So. Uh, the most important figure of Ljubljana's architecture is uh, Joze Plichnik, who was also living and working in, in Prague for a while. Uh, this is the part of, of the church that he did and who marked uh, uh, also Ljubljana with his projects a lot, with his daring gestures that connected the city in together, like the line along the river or the Vegova Street or this small intervention in the castle that I'm going to show you now which somehow connected an alley of trees with a very small hill, with a very, very small ruin. What he did here is that he shaped the terrain. He created a kind of a cone out of this hill, and he uh, put on this small ruin a small bridge. And by that, he connected this small piece of architecture with the landscape and enabled a very freely circulation around this um, this small um, remain of the past. This is one of the sketches of his work, and this is the approach to this, to this project, where you see people are approaching through the alley, you see already the landscape shaped in, in a very special geometrical way, and uh, you are approaching this circular pathway ar around here and moving to the bridge that is crossing and going and leading you to the ruin. So through that, he's organizing the possibilities of all the users to move around, to move through and uh, go and see this ruin from all different spots. If his intervention was not allowed, which would not be possible actually today, people would just look behind the fence to this uh, old stone wall. Now they can move around, they can touch the stones and they can walk over it and see different layers of his intervention and of the past bind it all all somehow together, somewhere also in a very dramatic spaces. You can walk above this bridge, you can step on a stair and walk along it, and at the end of the pathway, then you are faced with this open view to the horizon, looking to the city below you. I will show you now five of my projects, uh, which somehow span from this one that was the first project of a chapel to a more complex uh, renovation project. We were, for, for the first years, trying to intervene inside the existing with a very strong idea, with a very uh, connected gesture, trying to bring inside very uh, new and modern elements. During the years, these interventions became less, uh, less, less hard less visible sometimes because they were facing really very important um, monuments protected by the, the preservation office. Um, the first project uh, was built in the center of Ljubljana. If you know Ljubljana, these are the three bridges. And uh, this, the place of this project is just in, in this spot. This is the Franciscan monastery. This is the old image of the church. And, here there was a spot where I was invited to a competition to do shops here in, in this monastery. Uh, there was already an opening existing here, but I decided not to break this wall because this wall is uh, connecting the church and the monastery above. Um, 
I was not selected to do this project, but actually the priest decided not to go on with the selected architect because he wanted to demolish half of this monastery. So they invited me to start working on, on the project that I proposed. But soon I saw that it is very complicated to create shops under the monastery. Uh, all the investors had different ideas. They wanted to be presented also outside. So fortunately, the main priest also see that this might be a problem. So he changed his mind and he came one day and he said, you know, I want to do here a meditation chapel, a chapel where people can retreat from the busy street and rethink about everything. So I was started to do uh, this small project, which was actually um, working with two rooms under the this, uh, this monastery, these are these two rooms, and uh, I suggested to build a small niche, uh, not to break too much this stone wall, and to create a ramp, inviting the, the visitors to go down uh, and come to the main space, which is facing the, the wall of the church, where I placed uh, this L-shaped element of a uh, gray stone, and on the back side, all these niches were connected with the uh, wooden cladding. So these are mostly the three elements, the white stone, the gray stone, which is here yellow, and the brown wooden cladding. Uh, somehow this white is connecting all the three elements in a, in a unity. Uh, I, sh I proposed a side uh, opening for the daylight, and here is this small project. This is the niche of the entrance using the same stone and just the inclination leading you to the door, the ramp bringing you to the lower space, the wooden connections, a small room to speak with the priest, uh, an angel already existing in the monastery, and, and just the cross. So this is the door following the structure of the stone and the light coming inside also from, from, from this door. And when you go up, you, you, you step back again to the life. Actually, the life uh, has been changed since now, these 25 years since the chapel was done. It is closed for a while because there were people from the sleep, street sleeping inside and the priests now decided to offer it to another people to rent it. And now they plan to do a bakery shop out of it. So the times are changing, as you see. Um, but with the same priest, I was somehow invited to go uh, to a village on the west of Slovenia, uh, which, is the, which is a small village um, here having a big church beside it. This is the biggest pilgrimage place in, in Slovenia, where on the 15th of August, people come and have a celebration outside. So for this celebration, they used to build an altar in front of the church and put the chairs. And there were trees here and uh, some walls. Uh, what is interesting that these walls were uh, created by Plichnik uh, in the end of the 20s. So they shaped very interesting the whole structure and the proportion of this square in front of the church. And the, the church, uh, the, this square has a beautiful look to the highest mountain of Slovenia. It has a look to these walls of Plichnik and of course the church on one side. So it was very complicated. We were asked actually to remove all the walls, to make a larger square and to make a new open air altar where to put this altar, not to destroy all the values of this space. So we were thinking and we decided, and we convinced also the priest not to demolish this, this upper, upper somehow park. This park is two meters above the level of the square and it was created, all the walls were done by Plechnik. So you see the beautiful shape of the square and uh, the walls that are defining it. So this is the view to the mountain and this is the church, and this is this Plechnik's element. So we decided to put all the necessary infrastructure at the storage and the altar on this northern wall. So we proposed a very white model with very, let's say, invisible structure of the pavement and uh, the altar that is somehow pushed inside this existing wall. And we were thinking a lot about the materiality of this intervention, how to be close to the existing, uh, existing elements of the space. And here's the model of the altar. In fact, uh, 
my idea was what I discovered after thinking actually this, uh, this uh, closet that was done by Plichnik, it is existing still in a church near Ljubljana and it is a very simple wooden closet which was serving as an altar in a school before the church was built. But what makes this closet unique is actually this Carrara marble inside the simple wooden closet. It is making out of this very modest piece a uh, kind of a sacred element of architecture. And after that, we found a similar motif also on the church, as you see here, done by another architect. So this is, these are the images of the construction site. As you see, it's not easy. We had to support the existing walls. And th this is how the square looks afterwards. On the left side is the altar. It is closed usually, but the doors can open very easily. And when there is a, an event or is a mass or a ceremony going on, they can open the doors. And this is the interior, which is done out of the birch wood. So the interior is very much different. And um, the light is coming to this interior from the back side. These are the seats. And uh, this is the look out to the square in front of this intervention. With some simple squares, we tried uh, steps, we tried to continue the motif that Plechnik did on the other side. So you see the elements of the stone coming down to this uh, brushed uh, terrazzo concrete flooring. And this is the renovated staircase of the Plechnik's intervention on the other side of the square. And this is this small park that is on the other level, which is a very beautiful, intimate space uh, compared to the public space below. This is a retreat for all the, the pilgrims and visitors of, of this uh, space. Some years after, uh, we, we were invited to visit uh, a small manor in front of the castle. This is a castle along the river Drava. It is in the eastern part of Slovenia. And uh, on a kind of peninsula above this river, there was a castle. And the castle had a kind of a manor building behind it. Um, this is a beautiful landscape, this east of Slovenia, full of very, um, let's say, um, flat land uh, and traditional housing uh, that we wanted also to respect. Uh, when we came, this was the image of this, uh, this uh, almost ruined uh, situation. This is the castle, and this is the uh, kind of uh, U-shaped building in front of the castle. Um, this, this building showed some, let's say, interesting elements. There was some demolished part, and this was rebuilt in, in the 50s. So when we approached the building, we saw that it is certainly having certain values uh, on the outside, like this facade, like the arches of the building. But when we entered, we discovered beautiful vaulted rooms almost everywhere in the ground floor. So we decided, of course, to keep them. And uh, because we were asked if we really want to do the project for a very little money. But they said, we want to have here a music school and a small museum. And after seeing the place, we, of course, accepted um, this opportunity to do this project. So um, this building already has a very interesting position. This is the main square of the village, of the town, which is ending in this u shape building. So this square in front of this building is a very important place for us. You see here on the plan, this is the main square of the town and this is the X going to this area. Because this town is a very important prehistoric site, it was not possible to add to this to these existing buildings almost anything. We were allowed only to add here where there were some barracks already existing. So we had to fit in site the walls, everything was necessary. And we had to decide where and how to place the program. So we put the music school on the left side and we put the museum on the right side. Here we had the possibility to add a new addition on the first floor. And here we reused all these different beautiful spaces, like creating different ambiences for the exhibition material. In the upper floor, you can circulate, you can use the staircase here, going up and going down back again, and somehow using this whole volume uh, in a different kind of ways. So these were proposed the elements to be exhibited, like from 
the archaeology to the some remains of the more recent past, like this this monk of uh, of the eighth century that was um, here uh, in the castle. So this is the pathway that we created. You enter here in this new created space that had no walls, then you go, move through different spaces, go down a little to this arched room, go up the staircase, move, and you can go here to the children department and exit down there, or you can down, uh, move down to this area and exit on the same level. So this movement through the plan and opening the plan and to enabling the visitors to move around in different ways is a very important thing we do. The other thing is how to do this cleaning, how to enable this free space inside this built structure. All the walls you see were there, and we proposed to remove the ones that were not, oh, sorry, that were not valuable, like the ones that were already demolished, or the ones that were dividing this beautiful space, or the ones that built up all these arched, uh, vaulted, vaulted uh, rooms. And here we created the main entrance to the museum. So through that demolition, we shaped new units. The, the main hall for the, all the, the promotion of the musicians, the rehearsal hall for the trumpet band, and of course the spaces for the museum exhibition. So uh, this new canopy is connecting both programs, the entrance to the, to the museum and the entrance to the music hall. So, um, so, how, so here you see how the construction site looks like. It's, it's uh, very uh, demanding and very interesting. It's a kind of a, um, adrenaline because always everything is somehow changing very fast, and the new void is somehow shaped out of the existing structure. So the light starts to enter the spaces. You see how they are now perceived like a unity, and uh, you see the columns that were before divided by the walls, how they, they look like. This is the entrance hall to the music school, and this is how it looks today. We used the brick as the guiding material because we were uh, asked to use the brick because it had to be on the roof. So we exposed the vaulted uh, uh, rooms and we did the lit brick pavement for the floor. This is the white hall between the museum and the music school. And this is the most beautiful space in the museum that had two, art, uh, two columns. And this is uh, how it looks after the renovation. So um, this is the entrance room to the museum with a small shop with the um, and the space where you can buy the tickets. And so you move down there to the archaeological space where all different spots of findings are exhibited. Actually, it was proposed to create different ambiences uh, to exhibit all the materials and presenting the everyday life of this community in the prehistoric times. So we used, uh, we used drawings of a, of a guy who died very young, who came from this spot and who drew how this place looked like in the prehistoric times as a, as a kind of a, a scenography of the fireplace that is presented, for instance, here, or uh, some elements that are put here with the director of the museum and my partner in the project, Giga. So here you see the, the sample of, of all the materials that we wanted to use. For instance, the brick that had to be for the roof uh, was used also for all the new interventions. First, we planned to have the wood, but then we decided to use just brick for everything, for the flooring, which is on the left side, and for all the new interventions. Uh, just in some parts, like in the white hall, we used just this very simple stone. And somehow the story started to connect while presenting the clay models from the prehistoric times, like the ones you see here, these are the men and women figures. We use the same material also for our new intervention. And through that, we paid a kind of an homage to all these traditional buildings that we met along the way, because they are disappearing. They are going to be gone in a couple of years. Therefore, we wanted to use the similar motives to construct our new interventions in, in the new walls that we had to add to this existing building. So here you see the interior spaces of the new museum, uh, the lookouts to, to the park, 
and the waiting room in the uh, music school for the people or kids who wait for their lectures. And this is the main hall for the theory of the music with the big window looking to the park. So you see the, the level that was added to, to the music school uh, instead of this 50s building, the new addition of the rehearsal hall. And this is the, uh, the image of the main square in front of this building. So by keeping everything that was existing white and everything that is added is built out of brick, while that connecting the new interventions with the, the roof, uh, uh, connecting all this, let's say, free, uh, free arms of the building in one unity together. By that, we, we shaped the square in front of the building and we orientated the visitors also towards the views to the castle and towards the views to the, to the city. So you see how this space com works when the community is gathered in front of the building. This was for the opening ceremony uh, that uh, it started to serve as the main square in front of this uh, new program. Um, now, the last two projects are a little bit more, let's say, complicated and less uh, visible, less materialized in the new interventions, since both buildings were very much, uh, let's say, protected like uh, very special buildings. Uh, this project was built uh, three, four years ago. Uh, in fact, it's a renovation of a hotel from the beginning of the 20th century. It is called a Schwitzeria. That is a kind of a Swiss house. Um, it was uh, before that, on the spot, there were existing some small houses, like the Green Sink in Vienna. No? And uh, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, the owner decided to order a project to, a, uh, to an architect, Cyril Metotko, who built this strange building on this spot. Uh, it should resemble on a Swiss architecture, therefore it gained its name, Schwitzeria. And it served as a hotel only a couple of years. So you see this old postcards serve us how to, uh, how to treat the building, in fact. But we did also some changes, of course. This is the image how this building looked when we came. Because during years, it became a place for Russian immigrants. It was also a kind of a so-called public house. And after the Second World War, it became a, um, a hostel for artists. So artists were working and living in this spot, and it was very popular because it's on the edge of the main Tivoli Park of Ljubljana, being a quiet place to live and work uh, here. So the city decided to keep the same function, not to renovate it into a hotel and make it less public than it was now. It decided, the city, to keep the ateliers in this building. So we had to do many diverse proposals how to put different kinds of ateliers, living ateliers, sculpture ateliers, uh, painting ateliers inside these existing spaces. And it was really complicated to, to uh, recognize what is really valuable here in this building and what not, because the spaces looked like that. But the building is protected like the local monument, so there was a conservation plan done, and every elements were studied, and there was a evaluation plan presenting what is really important and what not. So when we did the plan of the underground level, we, uh, we gained two ateliers for the sculptures in this level, and so many demolitions had to be done to achieve that and to also add a new building on, on this spot. So this is the plan of the underground level. In the ground floor level, there was a beautiful space that not, did not exist. It was a cafe and a restaurant here, and we, we proposed to do it the same on the same spot and use this area as the new entrance to the, to the restaurant, while the, the main entrance is here on the side. And here we gained two other high spaces for the sculpture ateliers, and we did all this demolition in the ground floor level. And... Uh, we did some in new interventions, actually, because the building was very interestingly asymmetric. It had an entrance here on the side. So we wanted to emphasize this entrance and to break out with the view to the forest. So while adding these two new cubes, the, the level here was already existing, we break uh, the, a big window where you can look in, from the building interior to the forest. 
So um, this is the, the plan in front of the building that was done by the landscape architects uh, Anna Kuchan and her, her partners. And this is this new addition that we did on the northern part of the building. So uh, you see all the tests that had to be done because you need to convince the heritage protectors uh, that something new can be added to this existing building because it was not easy to demolish this existing part and to add the new glazing and light to this stone um, uh, atelier here below. We did many also renderings how to intervene with new uh, interventions like the infrastructure, like the storage, water and everything, how to uh, incorporate all the new language and connect it with the existing language of the building. So you see how these things went on. This is the state before it started. These were the demolitions. And this is the newly built addition here, this concrete uh, volume that you see that was added on the side. And this is the new interior of the uh, new sculptures pavilion that is added to the building. So this is this new addition and this glazing up on the upper part. Uh, inside the building, the building was very interestingly structured. It had stone construction, brick construction, metal construction and also wooden additions. So we did a study how all these materials were somehow happening through the building to enable us, in fact, big demolitions that were planned, like the one here that you see, when these walls were demolished, we gained this big space of the restaurant with these two freestanding columns that we had to do, the under foundation that we had to do, the stabilization, and of course, then the restorators came and they put back the, the paints that were, some of them existing, some were uh, uh, reconstructed to the space that is now a cafe and a restaurant of this um, of this uh, whole building. So you see the very rich materiality of this time, of the beginning of the century, in the wood, in the ceramics, in the paintings. This is the second intervention happening in the staircase while emphasizing this entrance direction and uh, trying to bring light inside this corridor from this side. So you see the light that is now entering from the new window on the roof and litting all this staircase corridor. We demolished some spaces here on the way and uh, created the new staircase that is bringing all the visitors to the upper floors. So this is the renovated staircase, the existing flooring with all these important elements and the light that comes from above and brings you down. And with this double height space where a sculpture presented her installation at the moment of, of the opening. So the interior spaces were, of course, freed with all these recent interventions and afterward they were stabilized and now there are ateliers like the one you see here. Or we discovered beautiful paints underneath that were impossible to be kept and we, we added some new elements respecting the existing materiality of these spaces. In some spaces, the, the, the paintings were preserved. In some of them, it was not possible to keep them. So this is the, the ground floor level, and this is the attic, where there was a new materiality, a different one, uh, spruce uh, partition walls that were used also with the new elements of uh, covering the toilets, the storage rooms of uh, each atelier. This is the sculpture atelier in the ground, underground level, with this beautiful stone uh, wall that could not be kept because of the insulation, but we kept the, the window and we inserted a new, new glazing on the top, uh, bringing northern light to this uh, wooden, uh, to this sculpture atelier with this window that can open and connect the user with the uh, forest environment. So this image of the past is now looking like that. It's a very let's say, a very uh, sweet building with the different uh, wild decoration that was reconstructed, but still opening a beautiful park in front of it and connecting with the views to the castle of Ljubljana. Um, and so uh, I came to my last project. This is the renovation of the Plichnik house uh, in, in Ljubljana. This is a project that is now already six years old. Yes. Um, we were invited actually to do the execution project. Uh, they had already the building permit for this building 
uh, renovation and we were just asked to do some details for the renovation. Uh, so we started to deal with Plechnik and we started to work um, and study and do the research about his projects. Plechnik uh, studied in Vienna with Otto Wagner. Here you see a photo while he's still a young student there in Wagner's school and here on these photos he is still smiling. Here you see him together with Otto Wagner in Vienna and with some of his colleagues. One of them is probably Jan Kochera that invited him also to come to Prague. So in his later years he posed very seriously. He was a very serious professor and was a very strict person. Mm, and uh, very somehow also perhaps not an easy personality. Uh, his first projects in Vienna, like the Zahar House, were very monumental in scale, as well as the Prague projects that are big landscape uh, interventions that are uh, somehow opening the spaces uh, of the Prague Castle to the public. Also in Ljubljana, he's mostly known by big scale open spaces like the stairs around uh, Ljubljanica River or the colonnade of the marketplace or the cemetery colonnade uh, structure, which is one of my favorite photos by, by the photographer Damian Galet. But when he moved to Ljubljana in 1921, he moved to this very small, modest, tiny house behind the Tarnovo church. This house was bought in 1915 by his um, brother Andrei and uh, he wanted them, all three brothers and one sister, to live here once together. This is the plan of the house that you see, a very simple house. And Plichnik, when he moved here, was dreaming to make an addition to this house. So he planned a circular, tubular uh, building to add to this house. So you see the first part of the house, and he was living first in these three upper rooms in the attic. He was entering the house here. Then he added this first addition and this spot, and he started to enter the house from this northern part. A couple of years later, he added another room. This is a colonnade room and a canopy uh, that enabled him to enter from a dry uh, walkway from the street. And in the 1928, he bought another house beside this, and this enabled him to build uh, this new winter garden. So he removed from the side of the street where he rented all the spaces and he was living here on the back side. On the back side of this house somehow being connected with this huge garden that is back of the house. So here you see the photo of him standing in front of this tubular building uh, and you see some old photos how the building looked like before these uh, garden trees grew. Um, these photos taken when he died in 1957 served us for the, let's say, reconstruction of the ambiences, uh, how they were. The house is um, actually, uh, the house was given to his nephew, uh, he inherited it and he passed it to the museum in 1974. And the Museum of Architecture now gave it to the city of Ljubljana, which is taking care of the house. Here in the house, you see the situation, how it was when we started. Actually, in this white corner, a couple lived, and they had a park, uh, a car parked here in this passage. So you entered the museum here from the street, and you walked around, and then you entered the original house. So the idea was to find a new apartment for this couple and to connect the house into, into a totality. So these are some images of the house that seemed to be quite okay. No big interventions were really necessary. Uh, there were just some uh, new installations inside. But the city meant differently. They saw some cracks, they wanted new installation, and so everything somehow started. First they did the conservation plan while uh, emphasizing, of course, the most important part of the house as a place where you cannot touch anything. And, of course, dealing with the same with all the elements, scratching all, all of the plasters. And when we came, there was the plan already organizing the programs. And they put in the middle of the new part of the house the toilets. And we said, this is really not possible to enter just along the toilets. So we, we reshaped and reorganized the plan completely. We decided to put in the middle of this place a kind of a lodger, a new shop and the new entrance pavilion, 
looking to the street, looking to the new entrance that we proposed people to enter here and to, to see immediately the new patio so they can circulate around this space. We placed the museum part of the new entrance rooms here and we, here we put the workshop rooms and the small lecture room. Actually, the existing Plichnik's apartment is a very tiny house, as probably many of you know who visited this house. So only seven people can visit it at once and all the others who come can wait here, can see the museum, can sit in the patio, can see a movie of his work. So this part that was mostly and most daringly refurbished served as the entrance part where people can be organized and wait for their, their visit. So we were dealing a lot with the movement, with the movement around the loggia, with the movement through these museum spaces, and of course with the movement inside the house. So here you can go, you can circulate the exhibition, and there you can go upstairs, this staircase, you walk the attic, and then you return back this staircase. So this new organization of the house is enabling a kind of a spatial loop, as of course also the Schanze project of Plechnik is enabling the visitors to move freely around the space. So in the attic, there are three exhibition rooms here. It's a workshop room to prepare the exhibition and it's a room for the custodians. So all the visitors can also move through these spaces and walk different ways. For all this project to be really realized, we of course had to demolish some partition walls and connect better beautiful spaces like the shop space here that was before that divided with some partition walls. And of course, these are the descriptions of all the interventions that happened in the facade. And here, step by step, you're going to see how the house was mostly just cleaned in some parts. Now, this is the entrance facade after the renovation with the new door. It was just repainted. But on the back side, there were more daring interventions. We removed these big windows from the 80s and we placed very let's say flat windows that lit the, the attic floor uh, to present better the winter garden of Plechnik. And uh, unfortunately we had to remove all this plant that was growing around the tubular building because we had to isolate the underground level. Uh, so here you see the reinforcements that were done and the, the, the new plant is growing of the kits of this existing plant now back again on this facade. By the new heating pump, we gained the new uh, space under the level of uh, zero. And this is the, the spaces uh, of Plechnik's house after the, the um, renovation. There is just a new opening here that was already existing. And this is this uh, six column uh, uh, loggia where before you enter the house. This is the renovation of the winter garden where the wine tree is growing back again. This is the kitchen where we removed all the radiators and the heating is coming from the floor above. Now all the spaces mostly are just presenting the way he was living. He was a very, um, he was alone living here with the housekeeper and uh, mostly working and living in the same space. Here you see his working table and the bed at the same time in the same room. And all these uh, elements were after the renovation brought back, settled back again how it was. Uh, and put on the tables uh, as they were at the time when he was using that. Uh, this is a beautiful element that I like really very much. This is a proportion key. You see here the shoes of this man that is uh, shaping different two proportions. That was a tool for, for beauty, I think, that he was using. This is the existing staircase bringing you to the upper floor where all these three spaces are really beautifully connected in a in a line of, in a row of doors. And this is the transformation of the attic room to the workshop area of the custodians. And this is the bigger transformation of the courtyard where we removed all these recent additions. We scratched off all these added elements and we discovered beautiful different clusters that we wanted to present later. Uh, we did a new opening to the shop and this is it, how it looks today. This is the door to the shop. This is the presentation of these different clusters. And this is the glazing that can close also this corridor for the winter time. And this is the door that has a very interesting story. In fact, this door was looking like that when we started to work. It was painted gray. And when the restorators came, they started to scratch off the paint. And this showed up 
this door was like that. It was a kind of a porch that was added to a door that is below this mask. So somebody had to put a mask above this simple farming door. And we supposed it might be also a Plechnik's work. So we convinced the heritage to keep this door as it was and not to put this gray door back again. So this is the, how the door looks today. But the, the museum custodians, they wanted that you see inside. They wanted the glass door. And we said, it is not going to put a kind of a shop glazing here. So we did a small opening that can open and still enable the visitors to see inside the museum that they can enter freely during the day. So you see the presentation of the Prague and Viennese period in the first room, the door that can be opened to the backside room where his unrealized projects are exhibited. Like this is the sketch for this room. And in the main big room, there are the Ljubljana projects here in the model and three big projects presented in this Ljubljana uh, Ljubljana room. So while walking around, this is the new, the second corridor around the loggia that looked before uh, like that. And uh, today it looks like a waiting space for the lectures that happen in this room. And this is the space of the shop and uh, the entrance to the house where there is a timeline of his work, his photo and the view to the patio behind. So. These projects, like the former one and all these renovation projects, are a kind of an interdisciplinary project. And what is really interesting, and in the case of this Plechnik house, we were only women mostly working here. Also, the, the, the woman who was leading the construction site was a woman. This is the main conservator. This is an architect uh, from the restoration center. This is the main uh, restorator of all the small tools. And this is Anna Porak, the main custodian of the house. So um, this is an interdisciplinary group working on different fields and working very well together. So I think you as an architect in that kind of projects, you are um, a kind of a communicator and coordinator of all these different intentions. Of course, we were not always the same opinion. The conservator didn't allow us to transform the doors. They didn't allow us to break the walls. It was protected like not to be touched. But at the end, we were all friends. We were all satisfied with the final result. And this is somehow what I say, communication is the most important part of, of our processes. And the house is also a kind of a fortunate case, I have to say. The city museum who is leading all the programs in the house is very, is very active. So they promote books in the house. They organize discussions. Uh, and of course, also in our school, students sometimes break into the rooms where Plechnik's photo is presented. And here is the room of my studio in the school where he also did a kind of an intervention with this window. Um, and I have to say, with some research we do with our students, uh, his spirit is somehow still living, but not with the form of his project, not even with the architecture itself, mostly with the principles that he offered us, with the liberation of the public spaces that he, he enabled us in Ljubljana, being a very, let's say, reserved personality, he opened us public spaces that we can enter for free. And I find this as the biggest value of his work that you have to, you can enjoy, I think, also in Prague. Thanks a lot for your Thank you, Marisha, for a beautiful lecture. Uh, I was really happy to see a lot of the things that I saw personally again and again, and I would love to go back once more. I hope there are questions, because I think uh, the work is uh, excellent, and there are questions from the public. Please. Um, 
it is a kind of a developing relationship I have with him. Because when I came to Ljubljana, actually I don't come from Ljubljana, as a student in my first years, and I, when I saw his library, I found it the most outbuilding that I ever seen. But the reason, then through the years, uh, of course, um, being explained this architecture, especially I have to really mention Wojtek Raunikar, who explained to me that in his architecture, the form is not important, it's the idea behind it. It's, there are the principles that count. And especially by working with his architecture, this is not the only project we renovated his house, we renovated also parts of his insurance building. You start to understand what he was really doing, perhaps not what he was really thinking, because I'm not sure that he was thinking the same as we see his architecture, but... Um, I can see in his projects concepts, I can see ideas that are valuable for me today. I see uh, free um, fl floating space, free circulation space that probably he was not thinking about that. And in that sense, I find him as some kind of inspiration also for my work. And therefore, I think we need to study his work um, because it can offer us uh, possibilities that... Uh, that can be somehow, in another way, of course, used in the architecture we do today. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you. Very beautiful presentation. What strikes me is the, the spirituality of your work. Even, even though very little of it has anything to do with church or, or religion. Is there some way that you manage to convey that to your students? Because it's something, in my mind, that's missing so often by the architect. That's a very interesting question. I was never really thinking about that. I don't know what they get from me, but I try to share with them the passion, the passion how to see the things, how to experience them in a way that you have to use your heart in a way. You have to follow your intuition uh, step by step. Of course, after that, also understanding, but ratio is not everything in architecture, I think. And it's very difficult to teach that because you can't just say go and be <laughs> inspired. But of course, after being inspired, you have to know and try to understand that. But um, I think the senses are very important uh, and we try to encourage them to use that and of course to, to work on their own potentials. This is very important, how to... Uh, how to discover them and how to to become different as me as well. I think this is an important uh, uh, mission also um, to discover where they are really special. Thank you. Uh, I'll go back to the two pictures you showed in the beginning, the, the picture of the mountains. You said, that's what I was looking at when I grew up. And then the picture of the Mediterranean uh, uh, countryside or landscape that you said, and this is where I need to go every year to sort of restore myself. I mean, that is very spiritual. And, uh, and probably this sort of large scale uh, is something that uh, that can be seen in how you put your work into context. And it's very difficult to keep that in mind during the whole process of the building, where the details count. Can you commend that? Um, thanks a lot, Irina. That is really very nice of you, because um, this image of this forest I picked for my first lecture because I started to think what really makes me to do the architecture I do. In fact, this is the, this, um, this freedom of the space where I grew up, uh, where we were completely free to move around. This was a kind of a large-scale dimension, also this forested landscape. 
Um, and I think this affected me a lot. And I think we all, you all students, have to question yourself where you come from and what makes you what you really are. And I, I try to understand why I want to really to liberate all these spaces, why I want people to move around, because I had it when I was young, when I was a child, and I'm still not used to living in the city <laughs> so much. The other thing is, of course, this um, Mediterranean, which is even a wider horizon, this open sea, and uh, this every year, uh, three weeks that I spend there, uh, shaped me a lot, because this is a very different space. If, if we Slovenes are living in the Alps, like very much reserved, uh, being alone, being focused, introverted, uh, this Mediterranean is much more opening, sharing, being kind, being uh, soft, uh, um, taking care on, on the materiality, on the sun, on the climate, on the food, everything that makes our lives so beautiful. And um, therefore, these experiences shaped me as well. And between these two kind of polarities, we move also in our projects. Thank you. Questions? You were mentioning that uh, you're studying with your students the influence of Alica Masarykova on the work of Plechnik, and maybe comparing, as I understood it, the work of Plechnik in Ljubljana with the work of Plechnik here in Prague and Lane. Uh, can you tell us something about the process, how you want to do that? Because that's a pedagogical process, and we don't talk very often about how can you teach something like that. Um, well, about this project, I, don't, I can't really tell much because it's really being uh, in the face of uh, development. But still, we did the uh, last two years with a course of, um, of renovation or something, with my elective course, um, with our students, some research on, on the existing projects where we tried to find out what really happened uh, uh, to the state of certain Plechnik's projects. What was there before, uh, how he reacted, what actually he added, what, what were the gestures that he did by that, trying to understand how he did it. And with this project, I wanted to go a little bit further because he was using many references while making his, uh, his projects from Italy, from his travels, also from Greece, and I think all these things influence us, also us who are working today, but not directly. They don't influence us to do the next Parthenon or whatever, but uh, they stay somehow stored in our unconscious mind here somewhere back. And through planning, they, they, they come out in another way, in your way. But I think they are very important. And these research studies, I think, for the study are very much important also for me as for my students, because through that you start to understand, without drawing, you don't really understand what he did. By just looking on the phone, I think you don't understand. You have to try to go deeper into the space, into the layers of development, to understand what, what, what and to see perhaps also something that he was not thinking of, to see something that is important for you today. And um, this project, might offer us some new new insights, perhaps. We'll see. <laughs> we would be very happy if uh, we could cooperate in some way between our two schools, because the Slovenian students will be coming here probably to Prague, because they cannot work on this research if they don't come here. So we'll try to find a group of uh, enthused people and teachers to, to revive Plechnik's uh, ideas again and again. Any other questions? Yes, thank you, too. The question is, uh, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, you are an island leader. Some left leader. There was still some space for that. I hope so. <laughs> I hope we don't discover everything. Sometimes we are also not allowed to scratch off everything. But um, 
Yes, um, this dust is a very difficult task. Of course, um, this um, construction stabilization projects, this fire protection, these difficult things remove lots of the spirit sometimes away. And uh, I have to say, when we were renovating the Plechnik's house, um, once uh, one of our, my, my dear professors came to the house and uh, he knew the house before and he said, you know, the smell is gone. And I was really, really worried about that. <laughs> because, uh, in fact, uh, Plechnik was smoking and he, th there was lots of wood in, in all the rooms. But afterwards, now I was just there a couple of days ago, the smell came back, not of the smoke, but of the wood. So somehow, um, I think you can't just keep everything as it is, but trying to do as less as possible, it's also very important um, message. And sometimes it can be done, sometimes also not. Another question? thoughts uh, on the work or you are working recently uh, and the same topics uh, with the students, I mean in the same time, not subsequently, of course, you're doing that. Because, for instance, I have a problem to uh, work on the same topic uh, with students and in my practice because then I don't see the difference and I'm confused. So. If you do this, or if you have any experience with this, or if you, ha I guess you have not even thought about it, but. About the topics you mean? No, I mean uh, you're working on uh, some topics in your practice. And if uh, you are parallelly developing the same uh, topics with your students. No. No. Well, actually, I cannot avoid them, but I think. Um, I don't work intentionally on those topics with them, no. It depends on the project, but I'm sure I cannot avoid being myself, no? I'm sure I'm teaching differently than other professors. I, I think, therefore, students can choose their own studio and work with anybody they like, but uh, I don't want them to become my clones. I don't want them to follow the things I do. Um, I think it's sometimes it's not easy. To It depends who you have on the other side. But um, I think students have enormous potential of being differently. Being some, some of them are good photographers. Some of them draw well. Some of them are perfect in communication, but cannot think uh, a lot. And so, I mean... You have to discover these potentials and through that try to help them to become themselves. Um, about the topics, I'm not sure. Of course, light is a topic with many projects we do and concept, of course. We speak a lot about concept, I have to say. I mean, but this is an important thing in, in, in architecture. I think the question had a, a two-way uh, direction. One direction is uh, you as a teacher influencing the students and uh, the other is the students and their thinking influencing you and I understood that was what uh, Radek was uh, talking about.
that. kind of a, um, as a kind of a going into something unexpected, I would not be interested. Therefore, I grow with them. They help me um, reach some new new ideas. I, I don't use that for my work, I have to say, but I see things in another way and somehow unconsciously they probably come out in my works, but I, I never thought about that in this way, I have to say. But I, I pick every year a different task, many different tasks every year, because uh, I take it as a kind of a challenge. And these tasks, of course, are often connected with the works I do, but often also with, let's say, actual problematic in, in, in the society, in, in our profession, like... Uh, making something good, working for elderly people, uh, transforming industrial areas. These are not particularly the task I'm working in my office, but I think students have to be encouraged to, to think about, let's say, social role of architecture sometimes, or topics that are not, perhaps, um, they don't listen very often. And through that, I also learn something. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Another question? I have a question. Uh, taking risks is the theme of uh, this year's November talks. Where would you say you're taking the most risk when you're working as an architect? Which part of your work or your experiences where you feel this is risky. I'm going into an unknown territory. There are two things I have to say. One is um, the risk, whether I'm going to do an environment for the people that they would accept it. This was already with the chapel because I'm not a believer. And it was a question for me, will I manage to do the atmosphere where people will find what they are looking for there? It was the first question. Now we are doing a huge elderly home in, a, in an old monastery. And this is a big risk, because it's really a big challenge how to transform this old structure for the conditions that people need in these last years. So, um, mostly I'm concerned with that. Not so much like doing something wrong in the Plechnik's house. Not. It was perhaps a while, but it passed away, this, let's say, this kind of um, fear. But um, this is one risk that uh, I'm uh, thinking of a lot, whether people who are going to use my buildings will feel free will feel themselves, will find the appropriate atmosphere and or place to, to, to live and work. The second risk is that um, how far to go to respect the client. Because clients are, I was quite lucky with my projects, I have to say. I had almost none clients who were asking me to do something I don't believe in. But sometimes it also happens, and I have colleagues who say, you know, I'm working commercial architecture, but I'm also being paid for my work. But it really, you need to, to think very often how far to go to, to still respect yourself in the, the activities you are doing, not to, to do something you don't think is right. And this is, for me, the most dangerous risk we are facing as profession um, to follow the money too much. Thank you very much. And if there are no more questions, I will thank you for everybody. It was a pleasure having you here. And uh, I think the architecture we saw today was one of the best. And thank you very much.